All rise. Go ahead, Bula. Please be seated. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to return for a moment to the question of privileges of journalists. Um, we have, uh, in fact, a case on the subject. The case is a prosecutor against uh, Bernanin and Talic, decision on interlocutory appeal. And I would like, uh, for the record, uh, since uh, um, your um, argument may have uh, um, perhaps um, introduced a tiny bit of a confusion, I would like to clarify this. Uh, the decision of the appeals chamber in that interlocutor appeal concerned war correspondent Randall, who had been subpoenaed and refused to testify. In that case, the appeals chamber noted, and I quote, war correspondents are of course free to testify before the International Tribunal. And their testimony assists the International Tribunal in carrying out its function of holding accountable individuals who have committed crimes under international humanitarian law. The present ruling concerns only the case where a war correspondent, having been requested to testify, refuses to do so. The, in this regard, the appeals chamber determined that there was no absolute privilege uh, against uh, protecting journalists from testifying. Um, but prior to the issuance of a subpoena to testify to a journalist, a two-pronged test must be satisfied. First, the petitioning party must demonstrate that the evidence sought is of direct and important value in determining a core issue in the case. Second, it must demonstrate that the evidence sought cannot reasonably be obtained elsewhere. I um, have the impression that there was nothing in this case indicating an involvement of or standing of a news agency. Now the, um, the case um, is, um, the decision is uh, one of um, 11 December 2002. Um, just for the clarification of this matter, and now we are uh, returning to proceedings, 12 o'clock, um, 12 o'clock. Um, um, would it be all right for you to, continue for an hour and a half? Yeah. So we will now continue till 1.30 and then have a break. And uh, uh, I thank uh, Ms. Gibson for her argument during the first part of the session. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And if I could just um, interrupt lead counsel's submissions on Srebrenica just to return briefly to, to address what Your Honor has said. Um, we certainly agree that the privilege of war correspondence is a qualified one. So it's not an absolute privilege, like exists with ICRC staff, for example. You do have to satisfy a test um, before a journalist can be compelled to testify in this case. Our argument in relation to the Brajanin decision, and I'd refer your honours to our reply brief at footnote 195, in our submission, the Rajanin decision is relevant to situations only in the case where a war correspondent, having been subpoenaed, then refuses to testify. That decision concerned the assertion of the privilege and not necessarily its waiver. The appeals chamber was not addressing the question that's at issue in this case, being who can waive the privilege, the journalist or the news agency. And so for that reason, we still thought it was worth raising this question as not being um, one that's completely settled in the jurisprudence of this tribunal. And then I'll pass back to my lead counsel to continue his submission. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And returning to the issue of Srebrenica and the uncorroborated testimony of Momir Nikolic, which formed the basis of the trial chamber's finding that President Karadzic had referred to Zvornik when he said that the prisoners should be taken somewhere else. No rule prevents a trial chamber per se from basing a finding on the uncorroborated evidence of a participant in the crime who made a plea bargain with the prosecution. The question is whether it was reasonable for the trial chamber to have done so. We contend that no reasonable trial chamber would have based such a finding based on the uncorroborated testimony of Momir Nikolic. You need look no further than what other trial chambers have, who have heard Nikolic's testimony have done to see whether it was reasonable. In the Mladic case, the trial chamber declined to rely on Momir Nikolic's uncorroborated testimony concerning an alleged hand gesture made by General Mladic suggesting that the prisoners should be killed. The trial chamber said, in the absence of corroboration on this potentially important event, the trial chamber finds it is unable to establish beyond reasonable doubt that the encounter between Nikolic and Mladic took place and that Mladic made the alleged hand gesture. In the Blagojevich case, the trial chamber found that Momir Nikolic cannot be considered a wholly credible or reliable witness and that on matters that bear directly on the knowledge of the accused, such as what he reported to Colonel Blagojevich during these meetings or was told to do, it must require corroboration for such evidence in order to enter a finding against the accused. The danger of drawing conclusions from ambiguous language and intercepted conversations was brought home in the Kerstich case. There, the trial chamber had inferred that General Kerstich understood that 3,500 prisoners were to be killed from Colonel Biara's statement in an intercepted conversation that he needed help in distributing 3,500 parcels. However, the appeals chamber held that while such an inference may be drawn from this coded language, its meaning is insufficiently clear to conclude that no alternative interpretation is possible. The same is true with the Derenich Karadzic conversation. The trial chamber said that the use of code demonstrated a malign intent behind the conversation. But as in the Kerstich case, it is possible and indeed more plausible that the participants to the conversation were talking in code because they didn't want the Bosnian Muslim army to know the location of prisoners. And as in Kerstich, no reasonable trial chamber could or should have made this critical finding that President Karadzic ordered the prisoners to be taken to Zvornik and executed based solely on Nikolic's evidence. Our trial chamber also referred to the testimony of a witness who testified that Colonel Biara told him that the order to get rid of the prisoners had come from two presidents. But that same witness testified that he thought Biara was falsely invoking some higher authority to persuade the witness to help him. The witness emphatically testified that he did not believe for a moment, unquote, that President Karadzic had ordered any killings. So this is no corroboration that President Karadzic ordered the prisoners to be taken to Zvornik and executed. Now returning to the basis for the finding that President Karadzic agreed to and embraced the plan to execute the Srebrenica prisoners, we see again that it was composed of two things. Not only the, Karen, the conversation with Derenich, but subsequent actions. So let's look at President Karadzic's subsequent actions referred to the trial chamber. There are three. One subsequent action was that President Karadzic denied international organizations access to the Srebrenica and Bratanac area. This was simply not true. The basis for this finding was that on the 24th of July, a UN Special Rapporteur had sent a letter to President Karadzic requesting access to the Srebrenica area and President Karadzic never answered his letter. However, the UN's own report on the events of Srebrenica indicated that the ICRC gained access to the Srebrenica Bratanac area on the 27th of July. And the prosecution has acknowledged as much in its brief at paragraph 443. 
the trial chamber found that President Karadzic's order on the 14th of July declaring a state of war in the area of Srebrenica Skalani municipalities also served to facilitate concealing the executions. But if President Karadzic had ordered the prisoners taken to Zvornik to be executed and wanted to hide those executions, his declaration of war would have included Zvornik municipality. At the time he issued that order, on the morning of the 14th of July, there was fierce fighting in the woods of Skalani and Srebrenica municipalities, which was the actual purpose of the declaration of war, not to cover up crimes in Zvornik. So there is no basis to claim that President Karadzic denied access to internationals. Next, the trial chamber found that the accused embarked on an effort to disseminate false information about the fate of Bosnian Muslim males. And third, it found that the accused took no action to initiate investigations or prosecutions, and in fact commended those involved in the Srebrenica operation. But both of those presuppose that President Karadzic had ordered the transfer of the prisoners to Zvornik and knew that they had been executed. If he didn't, there was nothing false about the information he disseminated or wrong with commending those involved in the taking of Srebrenica. But even if President Karadzic had found out subsequently that the prisoners had been executed, denying the killings after the fact or failing to punish, while it may attract liability as a superior, does not equate to sharing a common purpose to execute the prisoners. And as we've pointed out in paragraph 799 to 804 of our brief, to be responsible as a superior for the crime of genocide, the prosecution would have to prove that President Karadzic not only knew of the executions, but knew that they were committed with the intent to destroy the Bosnian Muslims as such. In the Popovich case, Lubomir Borovchinin's knowledge of the Kravitsa warehouse killings didn't mean that he was aware that those killings were committed with genocidal intent. And in the Blagojevich case, the appeals chamber held that although Blagojevich knew that some murders had occurred, absent knowledge of the mass killings, no reasonable trier of fact could have found that he had knowledge of the perpetrator's genocidal intent. Therefore, the subsequent actions referred to by the trial chamber provide no corroboration for the finding that President Karadzic agreed to and embraced the plan to execute the Srebrenica prisoners. Kindly slow down for the interpretation. Thank you. Stripped away of its trimmings, the finding that President Karadzic was a member of the JCE to kill the prisoners rests on the uncorroborated hearsay testimony of Momir Nikolic that he heard Derenic say that President Karadzic had ordered the prisoners to be taken to Zvornik. Srebrenica is the most well-documented war crime in the 20th century. Intercepted conversations, copies of orders, correspondence, and abundant forensic evidence has allowed prosecutors and judges to trace and reconstruct the events after the fall of Srebrenica on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And with all of this evidence, not a single item corroborated that President Karadzic ordered the execution of these prisoners. In the Kerstich judgment, the appeal stated that genocide, appeals chamber stated that genocide is one of the worst crimes known to humankind. And its gravity is reflected in the stringent requirement of specific intent. Convictions for genocide can be entered only when that intent has been unequivocally established. The trial chamber's finding that President Karadzic shared the intent to kill the prisoners from Srebrenica comes nowhere close to meeting that standard. And President Karadzic sits here before you convicted of a crime, genocide, that he did not commit. The core function of an appellate court is to correct such errors and prevent a wrongful conviction. So I ask you to reverse President Karadzic's genocide conviction under count two. Thank you. Have you uh, completed your argument?
Yes, Mr. President, and President Karadzic is now going to continue the argument. Once again, good day, Your Honours. I shall touch upon several grounds of appeal that I believe to be particularly important for the understanding of my appeal and my position. I would not like us to abandon the foundations and deal with the fifth or the sixth floor because that would be defeating to me, implying that we have accepted the first four floors and that it had to be that way. What I'm about to say cannot be said, unfortunately, in any milder terms. I do not wish to offend the members of the trial chamber who might have been helped in writing the judgment by a cohort of young, inexperienced people who might have also had certain prejudices but were certainly lacking in the understanding of our local culture, laws, and constitution. I appreciate the work of the opposite side, the Office of the Prosecutor, but that work is also subject to my critique. The indictment is based on a huge amount of material, as Ms. Gibson has already said, that makes us unable to see the wood for the trees. What's surprising to me is that we don't wonder what the motives are. How did it happen that the entire intellectual, moral, and professional elite of the Bosnian Serbs got involved in politics? I wouldn't have gotten involved in politics either if there had not been certain challenges that the prosecution has contested and proclaimed to be criminal. In other words, why would universities, university professors, lawyers, doctors in Bosnia and Herzegovina people who were dissidents for 40 years during the communist regime, gotten involved and committed. The prosecution is trying to find my criminal mens rea in my political statements, which were always designed to produce a political effect, but also from some remarks made in passing, jokes, and the humorous remarks of other people as well, official and unofficial alike. However, one thing cannot be circumvented, and that thing is what was the reason for Serbs to rise up and defend themselves. The indictment, and unfortunately the judgment as well, is permeated with findings that I tried to persuade 
Bosnia's Herzegovina to become carved. Bosnia and Herzegovina did not have the right to secede. And a very important personality in this tribunal, Judge Kaseze, wrote simply that it was a revolutionary affair and that they did not have the right to unilateral secession. That it was a matter of violence. Prosecution witness Mr. Trainer has said that what the HDZ and SDS did in the Assembly of Bosnia and Herzegovina on 15th October was an application of political violence. I will give you the reference in a moment. Ever since then, the prosecution has stuck to its position despite this testimony. This was something that in fact compelled the entire Serbian people in Bosnia and Herzegovina to become involved here it is, Judge Kaseza said, in Paris, 91. Oh, the six Yugoslav republics did not have the right to external self-determination. The acquisition of independence of Slovenia, Croatia, BH, and uh, FYR Macedonia can accordingly be observed as a revolutionary process which took place outside of the boundaries of existing legal norms. This was stated for the magazine Economica in France. You will see in the indictment and in the judgment as well how many times I was criticized and accused for a number of eminently legal and lawful things that I was not only entitled to, but I would have been criminally liable in my own country for high treason had I not done them. I will have to skip from subject to subject because the sequence of my slides uh, is not uh, ideal. Namely, the prosecution imposed on the trial chamber the skipping over of some vital matters and to seek my mens rea on some fifth floor or on the roof. Here you see this slide. The trial chamber accepted the prosecution's suggestion that even my first statement at the founding assembly of my party was that would not cooperate with any parties which have even the slightest trace of anti-Serbism. Just see how this was misused. The integral text you see here means that this party shall not cooperate with anyone who is against Yugoslavia, against Serbs, that harbors anti-Semitism and anti-democracy. All these anti-mankind movements at this time are rife in the neighboring republics. And that motivated me to get involved in politics, whereas I had no personal need for it. So in such a situation where 
all around us. Horrible things were going on, the prosecution and unfortunately the trial chamber as well. Maintained that I had no right to oppose the unilateral secession of Bosnia, that I did not have the right to urge people to join the Yugoslav People's Army, which was the only legitimate armed force. And all of this resembles very much the political boilerplate of the previous regime. Let us see what is written in paragraph 2654. It was clear that even in the speeches in which he spoke in favor of improving multi-ethnic relations and against violence, the accused stressed that the Bosnian Serbs were ready to use violence if they considered that they had been attacked and would not cooperate with anyone seen to be against the Serbs. This statement, the first part of the statement was by then one and a half years old. But in order to blacken me and portray me as a person who is only concerned with his own people, this second part of the sentence from 1990 was added. I believe this is something that absolutely must not be done. The child chamber should have cautioned them that they have no right to do this. As I said, I don't have my slides in the correct order. In other words, I was accused of unjustly, unjustifiedly frightening the Serbs in Bosnia with prospects of genocide, a genocide that never happened in our history, but I invented it. In fact, there is not a single home in Bosnia-Herzegovina that has no victims in their family of the fascist genocide that happened in the Second World War. If anyone knows this well, it is certainly this institution. And the rising tensions in our country were the result of the renewal and restoration of this ideology. And as Mr. Goldstein stated, year 1941, 1941 is coming back. Here, another slide. A great Jerusalem mufti visited Sarajevo at that time formed a Hanjar division made up of Bosnian Muslims and gifted it to Hitler. It was a particularly notorious and brutal unit, especially keen on massacres of Serbs, Jews, and Roma. So there was this Hanjar division, and now the Serbs should not be worried about the restoration of it. Here in 1983, Mr. Izetbegovic, for the second time, was convicted for his Islamic declaration which from the moment he came into power became the platform of his political activity. When they convicted him in 
1983, I supported my friends in Belgrade, including Dobrica Ciosic, in defending him because nobody should go to prison for writing a book. And he told me that the Christians uh, would not be victimized by this. But here you see five Muslim judges found him guilty. This is something else yet. Colin Powell stating that it was not only Serbian para paranoia. The Serbs had very good reason to be worried about being in a Muslim-dominated country. This is another excerpt from the judgment against Izetbegovic. That was written in a book, but at the time for which I was indicted, uh, it had become a real threat to us. Here you see what would happen to the enemies of this idea. And now I have to come back to the many instances where my words were travestied. The judgment is replete with such instances that were put to the trial chamber by the prosecution. Here we see another conversation in July 91. Milosevic told the accused that their objective was to have disintegration in line with our inclinations. It was July 91, Bosnia was still peaceful, and he is saying with regret that they were about to secede. And we have to look after our own interests. But the talk here is about Yugoslavia. It has nothing to do with Bosnia. In all our activities, we relied on the constitution of Yugoslavia, the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the laws on defense, and we also relied later on the results of the peace conference that was taking place in The Hague. In November 91, we received this as the law. On the territories where we were in the majority. And this was the so-called special status. Here you have an, another excerpt from <coughs> Judge Cassese that we have read already. Let me just recall that Muslim secular parties were along the same line as us and have supported the agreements that Izetbegovic later reneged on. Here again, the prosecution expert, Mr. Trainer, said that on the 15th of October, when I was making that speech, which was later interpreted as a threat, it was in fact a plea and a warning that we might be led into war. If I had wanted war, I would have cheered the Muslims in their efforts. And if I had in mind a criminal, a joint criminal enterprise, it would have been impossible without a war. But the only party that made concessions till the last minute in order to avoid war were the Serbs. Another statement. Milosevic advised me that we should accelerate mobilization, acquire weapons, and save the Serbs. There was no war yet. And here, 
I asked President Milosevic if this truce with the Croats is honest. And he says, for the time being, because they are in a difficult situation, but it's not honest in a long-term sense. This was ascribed to me. Such patchwork in the uh, indictment is understandable because there is no evidence, but it should not be allowed. We were accused of intending to carry out ethnic cleansing. But here, look at what uh, President Tujman said to a, a U.S. delegation. Muslims told me once that they were going to exterminate Serbs in Bosnia. I asked them, how are you going to expel one and a half million Serbs out of Bosnia? He answered, Muslims should rely on Croatia and the Serbs would leave Bosnia sooner or later. All day, uh here we have deliberate, unprecedented confusion created when I was indicted and convicted of the idea of homogenization. First of all, a false image was created whereby peoples were supposed to be separated there and not state entities and that homogenization meant not grouping of territories with certain majorities but the ex expulsion of peoples and you can see in the presence of European observers before the war 10 villages Dobretic 4,800 Croatian within the Serbian-dominated municipality of Skendervakov wanted to join Yaitse or become an independent municipality. This is a right based in the Constitution. And the president of that municipality granted that, agreed to it. And it's a natural process. It's normal. Here, homogenization of areas. A government official here says on the 25th of February, and by that time it was already known that the European community accepted that we were going to have three Bosnias. Three Bosnias was an idea initiated by Badinter because he said that Bosnia was not like the other republics and it had to uh, be given its independence in a different way. And here it says briefly something about borders. Regional borders, excuse me, regional borders must be drawn up on the basis of the decision of citizens of each village, municipality, and region as to where they want to live, and so on and so forth. This is homogenization, the grouping in the administrative sense, nobody's going anywhere, nobody's persecuting anyone else. It would be grouping um, such as um, we have in the Swiss, Swiss cantons in Switzerland. There is a vast number of evidence in the uh, case file that um, the S Serbs asked for a transformation of Bosnia according to the Swiss model and the transformation of Sarajevo according to the Brussels model, where everybody would have their own municipality. There would be no borders, but they would be finishing all their work in their own. On the 8th of March, 10 days before the Lisbon Agreement was accepted about the three Bosnias, Secretary Vance goes to see Genscher and says, Dr. Karadzic, the leader of the Serbs, was also positively inclined towards these talks. He wanted to avoid a war at all costs in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is no um, JCE without war. You cannot make it. There is no way to, to have that. And once again, what the Ustashas were doing in 1991. No, no, sorry, in 1941. Over 500,000 Serbs 
and 250,000 converted to Catholicism and 250,000 expelled. This is the well-known theory about three-thirds. On the 12th of May 1992, at the assembly where we decided to have an army, I still am committed to three ethnic communities reaching an agreement and for the war to be stopped. But this, this does not imply in any way the expulsion on it, of anyone. No chance of that. And here we have Hitler's intelligence service, secret police writing to Himmler from Zagreb. The terrible deeds were committed by the Ustasha against the Serbs. The Ustasha groups had committed their horrendous acts, especially against the elderly women and children and so on and so forth. In the 10 months of the war, there were already 300,000. This is February 1942. So by that time, already 300,000 Serbs were killed. And the prosecution and the trial chamber is putting to me that I was un that I was needlessly alarming the Serbs. There isn't a single home in Bosnia and Croatia which um, did not suffer casualties during uh, World War II. So here it says that the JC was born in October 1991. Another uh, chamber of this um, tribunal in the Krajnik case on the basis of what I said on the 14th of February 1992 about the need to protect Muslims and Croats and keep them in our majority areas. The transformation or the division had already been agreed and the um, chamber concludes in paragraph 908 of the judgment in Krajnik. They say the following. For the interest of other peoples was still being expressed by Karadzic as separation and homogenization were not yet the declared aim of the uh, nascent leadership uh, in 1994 speech and, and so on and so on. Dakle, ovo već je pomera. The trial chamber shifts the day of creation later from February 1992. And here, we have August 1992, and we see what Karadzic said. As far as other nations are concerned, we have to have a proportion participating in the municipal authorities. We have to be responsible as we are forming a state. You are the organ creating it. I'm addressing the assembly here. The state must be created in the best way. We need to make it with all of its ingredients. This is the position from start to finish, and it never changed. And it was never foreseen anywhere that there would be no minorities. Excellencies, may I remind you, the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina was a municipal war. Wars were breaking out let's say, wars in the western part, the war in Priedor, Sanski Most, in Kluč, broke out eight or nine weeks after war broke out in um, Sarajevo. That was when the Serbs were the strongest. Why didn't they kill them and expel them then? Why were there crimes only in some 20 municipalities. Why? And I recall the evidence that is in the case file, D2424, for example, and P3788. These exhibit from Ed Wuyami, who is not um, um, favorably inclined towards the Serbs, 
says that Muslims who were not fighting had no problems, they live like everybody else. Some documents uh, were disclosed late by the prosecution regarding Grbavica, for example, in 1993 and 1994, different UN agency were um, surprised that Muslims and Croats did not want to leave Serbian Grbavica. They were not enlisted in the army, so they were positively discriminated. Serbs had to fight, they did not have to fight, so they were wondering why anybody was um, trying to persuade them to leave Serb territory. And now, this is not the right um, sequence, but El Husseini was a personal friend of Hitler. He would come to Sarajevo, he would sleep um, with our partners in our government. And this is what the state agency, the report of the state security said. In the summer of 1943, when the Islamic reaction endeavored to create a so-called Islamic army, Alia Izetbegovic and others had organized the purchasing of arms, ammunition, sanitary materials, as well as other equipment, and so on and so forth. And since also I'm being um, challenged on all the reasons for uh, taking care of the Serbs and saying that I generated unrest and alarm for any, without any grounds at all. Here we have David Owen saying it was extremely provocative for the Serbs in Croatia that Tujman adopted the NDH independent Croatian um, um, fascist satellite creation of Hitler during World War II. Well, perhaps when I move to Sarajevo, I will come back to this slide. This is the 27th of March, 1992. The Cotillero Agreement is in force for 10 days already, and I'm addressing the assembly I am saying that they should undertake everything with the full authorization of the assembly to organize defense, exclusively defense. And on that day, the Council for National Security was founded. His Excellency Judge Meron uh, mentioned it when he was reading the, um, the um, context, the introduction. On that day, Gangs crossed over from Croatia as if they were going to a, a wedding and killed scores of people in the village of Sjekovac in Bosnia. The war had not even broken out yet. The police didn't come out. They were not interested in protecting the citizens. And for that reason, we formed the Council for National Defense. And um, here you can see that I am calling for preparations for defensive purposes and that at any cost we should strive to maintain peace, that peace was in our interest and that the conference had already yielded positive results. Had we done nothing on our own, actually there is evidence that we did nothing of on our own. So in November 1991, Mr. Izetbegovic um, committed himself that there, the components of the population would have a five-year um, um, arrangement, including a minimum of common functions, after which the um, Republika Srpska could eventually secede. As for the separation of states, I spoke about that on the 12th of May, 1992, at an assembly session. This is a prosecution exhibit, a P exhibit. And the last sentence in this paragraph states,
that there was never any, um, any um, intention to separate the population. We had to change the strategic goals. We had to prepare for negotiations. But Muslims were still living throughout Republika Srpska at that time as well. And at a rally the following day, we told him, told them, you are not the enemy. The enemy is um, the extremist leadership alone. Um, this is also something that was um, uh, assigned to me, ascribed to me. But actually, President Tujman heard somewhere in Europe that Muslims needed to be controlled. We already showed this. This is something that we were granted. We were granted these rights. This was on the 4th of November. We were granted the right to show our national emblems to autonomously run our educational systems to uh, judiciary bodies in and to administrative structures, including the judiciary and a regional police force, also to have our own legislative bodies. So we were promised then to stay in Bosnia. We had the right to remain in Yugoslavia in the same way that Northern Ireland remained in the United Kingdom with its own territories. And just like Western Virginia uh, remained in the Union instead of going to the Southern Confederation. Um, so this was a major part of Virginia. These were our rights. I am constantly um, said to have forecast um, uh, a catastrophe, that that was my foreboding. But uh, the way it's being ascribed to me is that as if it was uh, my desire. Why would I talk about it as my concern and fear if this were my wish? Which normal person would like for chaos to reign? We acted in keeping with the constitution of the SFRY. There was no chance not to defend the country. Each individual was bound to defend the country. Until the army arrived, they would defend it as best they knew how. Once the army arrived, then they would take over command. High treason is um, the punishment for um, um, impeding the defense of the country. It is the duty of each um, municipality to organize its own defense. I'm being charged here with the fact that the municipalities were defending themselves, that they were organizing themselves. There was army in each municipality. So until the JNA arrived, the supreme commander of the army was the municipal president by um, the nature of his office. This was according to the law. And this applied to every municipality. And here we have how the um, volunteers um, were created. A small part of them uh, went uh, rogue, and then that was later um, punished. But each one of them was a member of the armed forces of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, anybody who takes part in resistance against the enemy. A small part, number of them later had were brought to trial, so peace at any, any cost. And here we have a list of the people who knew what would happen, and they were asking uh, for um, things to slow down a bit. They were asking us not to rush. The uh, Bosnian Serb Assembly was the formal means through which the ideology and objectives of the 
um, Bosnian Serb leadership were officially sanctioned and disseminated. The Bosnian Serb assembly in Bosnia and Herzegovina was a highly educated body of people, a highly democratic body. I was criticized hundreds of times. Anybody had the right to speak. There is no way that it could be any form of means. And here we see um, what Trainer stated. about anticipating. The prosecution pressured the trial chamber to convict me because I was anticipating what would happen. But it wasn't difficult to anticipate. We could see what happened in Croatia two or three months before that, and what happened in 1941, and what happened in each war. There wasn't a war in the um, territory of Yugoslavia as a result of uh, foreign aggression that was not accompanied by a civil war amongst the different factions in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, each civil war. Here is what Trainer said about Serbs. Since Bosnia was in Yugoslavia, and the Serbs in Bosnia were in Yugoslavia, then all they had to do was just remain in Yugoslavia, maintain the status quo. If that's what happened, that would maintain the peace. If you're defending the status quo, you don't need a JCE. You're defending what you have. You're not requesting something new. You're satisfied with what you have, and you are defending it. Here, Trainer said that this was violence in the parliament committed by the SDA and the HDZ. This is about homogenization. And here is the trial judgment. Bosnian Serbs had agreed to the three main principles of the Kutilero plan, which stated that BIH would be an independent state, which was a very painful compromise for us, that it would maintain its present borders, and that it would consist of three constituent parts. However, when war broke out, the option of an independent BIH with cantons was dropped, or vice versa. When the Muslims or the SDA reneged on the Lisbon Agreement, that was when the war broke out. And especially in Sarajevo. Here's General Rose particularly in Sarajevo, Your Excellencies. In Sarajevo, for 1,400 days of street fighting, a smaller number of people were killed than it would be the case if there was any real terror. Around 6,000 Muslim fighters were killed, and between four and 5,000 Serbian fighters. As for the civilians, the numbers are smaller, significantly. Serbs only responded when they were threatened. And here is how the Muslims provoked crisis in order to accuse the Serbs and receive uh, or cause an international armed intervention. If the terror in Sarajevo suited the Muslims, it did not suit the Serbs. Why would the Serbs terrorize Sarajevo. There were 60,000 Serbs there, and neighbors, Muslims. And thirdly, the Muslim side used all the crises in order to stop any conference. The indictment and the trial judgment say that the Serbs were terrorizing Sarajevo in order to compel the Muslims to start the talks. But it was the other way around. The Muslims were causing crisis there was murder and suicide of their own people just to avoid conferences because they expected an international intervention, aid from Saudi Arabia and others. And here, a very responsible general we see is saying that. This is not so important. 
And here is how, once again, General Rose, he says that the French had even more serious evidence that the Muslim troops in the city were killing their own citizens, and that was rather a rule than an exception. In such cases, Your Excellencies, the UN needs to codify this once and for all. We were never allowed to participate in the investigation. The bench even said Karadzic requested joint investigation. Even he knows that neither the Muslims nor the UN would allow him that. Well, excuse me, if you wouldn't allow us that, then you cannot accuse us and put us on trial for those incidents. The Muslim side can produce something like that out of spite as much as it wants, but if we can't carry out an objective investigation, well, they were provoking this in order to cause a bombardment of the Serbs, and several times they were successful, but the UN must not allow this. If there is no joint investigation, you cannot accuse the side that was prevented from participating in it. Here is October 1991. Krajnik and myself are talking. We are monitoring what's going on in The Hague and we are happy that the conference in The Hague is progressing well and that things are moving in the right direction and that perhaps the bloodshed, which is still limited only to Croatia, not to... Uh, it didn't spill over to Bosnia, would perhaps stop. Your Excellencies, starting from the 20th of October until the 4th of November, to the beginning of the war, all my statements have to be viewed in context. The context of a conference, of new incidents. If I say, take power in a municipality, I didn't say take over. It's a significant difference. To take power, it means you got it, now you need to exercise it, and you have to make sure that Muslims and Croats don't flee. Now we have a constitutive unit, and it has to be ordered, disciplined, based on law. You can see that we are monitoring this, and we never made a single move without seeing previously that it had been agreed in The Hague. Here is how, on the 18th of March, a high official of the Muslim side celebrated the Lisbon Agreement, the Cutilero Plan. He celebrated it. He said, excellent, the Muslims uh, are doing great, and the Serbs were in a weaker position, but we accepted it, and to this day, to Dayton, we remained truthful to the Lisbon Agreement. Here is another excerpt from the press. It's D302. These are all exhibits. Here is what Trainer said. I've been accused here and attacked for making communities of municipalities. Now in Kosovo, the Albanians have to allow the Serbs to create such a community of municipalities. It's a constitutional category. And here is what Trainer said. It's uh, something recognized in the Constitution. The municipalities are entitled to those rights. Here I was attacked for strategic goals, as if they were war goals. We had strategic goals throughout all the negotiations the maximum and the minimum ones. When the war broke out, the negotiating team had to offer a new approach to the parliament. And here is how Trainer understood this quite correctly. Quite correctly. The goals and the objectives from the point of view of the Bosnian Serb negotiators headed by Dr. Karadzic throughout all the negotiations, and they underlaid the position of the Bosnian Serbs all the way through the Dayton meetings. The strategic goals, from the point of view of the Bosnian Serb negotiators,
were the goals that they sought to achieve. It was never implied that those were war goals. Local wars do not produce a fait accompli. There has to be a conference. Here is what Trainer testified. That our military factor should have won, according to military logic. And Karadzic said no. We have to leave room for the other people to be satisfied. I am accused of plans to permanently remove Muslims and Croats from Serb claimed territories. The trial chamber concluded that the territorial claims were not criminal acts as such, but that the removal of the population was. Then the prosecution understood that temporary removal during war operations was uh, an obligation, that it had to be done so, and then it added that the Serbs wanted to permanently remove. How are you going to remove somebody permanently when immediately after the war the status quo is re-established again, if possible? There's no chance to do that. I proposed and signed uh, proposals for the return of refugees. So this is just a myth about permanent removal or expulsion. Martin Bell and many others did not know many things when they gave amalgamated statements. During the trial and during their testimonies, they learned some things. This refers to Martin Bell and Trainer, and even Harland, Fraser, many people from the United Nations. If the chamber needs that, the defense can make a list. All these people corrected their views once they learned certain things because they hadn't known them previously. No one is taking this into account, what Martin Bell says. He learned this when he saw particular documents here in the courtroom. Communities of municipalities, we were attacked. Trainer said this was compulsory. These are the strategic goals, and so on and so forth. So, there is no way at all that something that is imputed in the indictment and in the trial judgment is really correct. I'm commenting on each and every paragraph. Most of the comments are exculpatory. What is alleged are exculpatory elements against me. One of the examples is when they say Karadzic knew that crimes were being committed. The police informed him. The police informed me that it was doing its own work, that it was doing arrests and uh, prosecuting. This should be exculpatory. Well, one of the myths that the prosecution has uh, succeeded in imposing on the trial chamber are the Serbian armed forces. In one of the paragraphs I, I'm listing, and th they refer to me saying that the Serbian forces were the army, the police, and the territorial defense, and the political ones were the SDS and other parties. The prosecution has managed to persuade the chamber that the Serbian forces, as a formulation, implied the JNA, with which we had nothing to do, nor could we command it. We didn't have control over one single soldier of the JNA. It was there until the 20th of May. Our territorial defense could not be independent as long as the JNA was present. It was resubordinated according to the law to the Yugoslav People's Army. And then, further on, it says the Serbian forces included the volunteers. The volunteers uh, were left behind after the JNA left. We did not have volunteers. There were some who became maverick. We arrested them. There's uh, evidence of this, and there's no doubt 
and paramilitary forces. Well, we arrested those regularly. So the Serbian forces were the army and the police. There were no other Serbian forces. And on the 13th of June, I prohibited the establishment of paramilitary forces. I ordered that they had to subordinate themselves to regular units or they would be arrested. And I said that I disowned them all and that we were no longer responsible for them. They are outlaws. How can anyone charge me for crimes of a mil paramilitary unit that we persecuted and prosecuted and that I disowned? These are matters that simply don't... This is what... Mole testified that the Muslims targeted themselves and that they wanted to bring about a military intervention. Why would Serbs terrorize Sarajevo and then bring about an intervention against themselves? It's clear whose objective that was. Here's Mole again. He was the chief of the monitors. He says that he knows Mr. Henneberry and that he was aware that such things were happening. General Rose said that they were rather a rule than an exception. Here's Mole saying that he believes, for political reasons, no public categorical statement that the Muslims were doing this could be made, that they were shelling their own civilians. However, that was general knowledge, common knowledge. that the investigations strongly pointed to the fact that the Muslim forces did on occasion shell their own civilians. Your Excellencies, one incident is sufficient for the prosecution to have the burden of proof proving that in other cases the perpetrators were not Muslims but Serbs. One Incident in Sarajevo, there are 260 mosques full of people, especially on Friday. I asked the commander of the Sarajevo Romania Corps, how many mosques did you hit? And he said, not a single one. Judge B Baird asked why. He said, well, they didn't shoot from the mosques. He only responded judging by the weapons, he did not respond by targeting the people. Here's Mole who said that it was part of the tactics. That civilian locations were being abused, neighborhoods were being abused, UN hospitals and schools, and these locations were used to fire from them. Mole again says this. He had personal experience with uh, those instances that the presidential side, or rather the Muslim army, would shoot at the Serbian side. So that the Serbs would respond and target those particular facilities. Here's Rose again about Muslims. The Muslims opened fire to the Serbs, hoping they would return fire towards settled places, which would be a new cause for the international community to condemn the Serbs. Your Excellencies. What the prosecution has done and what the trial chamber has done. With Goddess Justitia and her scales is unbelievable. On one side were international pacts, international documents about uh, human and international rights, the UN Charter, the Helsinki Convention about Borders, constitutions, 
domestic constitutions, domestic laws, parliament decisions, government decisions, and finally my presidential decisions, a huge number of documents. That was all on one scale. On the other scale were rumors, jokes, unofficial and sentences made by other people, gossip, and what weighed as uh, having more weight, the jokes and gossip. And on 16th of February, it was determined that no one could say who targeted Markale. All the UN reports did not want to accuse one side. And then we have a private person, a Muslim official, who says, now I'm going to prove that it was the Serbs. And the trial chamber takes that into account. If this is a UN tribunal, how is it possible that the findings of the UN are disregarded? Sometimes it was possible to get a testimony of people who attended certain meetings who alleged that I said something. If I had said that, the whole world would have known that in the presence of the UN. That would have been on uh, front pages. So they either distort my statements or they call someone who would say that I said something. And he sends a report at the same time and this is not included and it would have to be because those were such drastic matters. Evo, a prvo skazuje da francuzi su znali... Again, the French knew much more than more about these things. It is my personal belief that international justice is necessary, but this is the best way to ensure that there's never going to be one. The court did not allow us to demonstrate the conduct of the other party. In criminal law, one must make a distinction between what was necessary and what was criminal. There is such a thing as necessary defense. All the international factors agree that the strategy of the Serbian side was to contain the enemy forces from overflooding the entire territory. The Serbs did not advance anywhere. We did not advance on Sarajevo. There is so much evidence that our strategy was not offensive. Our strategy was defensive in all of Bosnia. The territories were not taken by force. Even the prosecution admits that even before the war we had 60% of the territory. Where we had settled ages ago and when the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, arrived, we ran to the mountains. This knowledge is easily accessible. The case file is replete with such evidence. But we are not allowed to show the behavior of the other side because that is said to be too awkward defense. It is not. If they attack and open fire on the Serbs, the Serbs have to respond at some point without even asking the commander or the president. A person simply has that right to defend himself. You will see in the judgment, it looks like a boxing match where you don't see one fighter, you only see the other. And whatever that second fighter is doing looks ridiculous. 
the prosecution claims and the trial chamber accepted, unfortunately, that I was crying wolf for no reason at all. If I'm saying it's going to rain while it's already raining, it's neither unnecessary nor ridiculous. If we were being attacked by the Muslims, our fight is justified. The prosecution has produced a number of witnesses whose testimonies were clearly exculpatory. However, the trial chamber ignored that. And it practically butchered my 230 witnesses. The they are renowned persons of high standing. They can be easily examined. However, their testimonies were rejected out of hand. I know that this legal system is different to ours. In our system, we don't rely only on procedure, but on meritum as well. If factual, if the factual basis has not been established or has been incorrectly established, that calls for a retrial. Certain statements were misused. Rights were neglected. Facts were distorted and motives were concealed. And the consequences of this entire conduct were then portrayed as sheer madness. After reading our appeal brief, our final brief, uh, all the evidence in the case file, I believe that the chamber consisting of highly qualified professionals and experts will find this judgment unsafe and quash it. This is not a jury trial. If it were a jury trial, I could believe that the performance skills of Mr. Kruger and the rest of the team outdid ours. But that was not the case. To deny that the Serbs, together with the Jews and the Roma, fell victim to a horrible genocide in the Second World War, and that they were rightfully scared of the same thing happening again in the indictment period is absolutely unfair. I am at your disposal to produce a list of twisted statements, a list of exculpatory documents that are even cited in the judgment, but they were not acknowledged. I will prepare all that if necessary, but the prosecution must not be allowed to establish new standards. Defense must not be hamstrung in any way. One party to the trial must not be stopped from participating in the investigation. This is our last chance. International justice will no longer exist otherwise, or it will exist. But it will be a gift for
for criminals. For this world, justice is the only hope. Justice and light. But they won't fall from the sky. We have to work for them. Darkness already exists. You have to create light to confront it. And the same goes for justice. If this court does not remedy the errors made. Your Honours, many innocent people are now in prison because the proceedings were improper. This could lead to several acquittals and reversals, which would save the honor of this tribunal. I am not embittered, but it is a fact that what was imposed upon the Serbian people towards the end of the 20th century and still goes on is a curiosity that will be remembered and remain. The judgments and the truths established about Bosnia will not evaporate. They will be confirmed and reconfirmed with each new day. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm at your disposal. Completing their submissions. We will now have uh, a pause and we will resume at uh, uh, 2.30 for um, the response by the prosecution. All rise. Why are you